Dear friends in Christ, I want to begin this year's annual address uh, with a prayer. It's a prayer that I use occasionally at meetings, and it is said to be the one that Sir Francis Drake would say before he set out to sea. Some of you will be familiar with it because you've heard me say it before. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we sail too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show forth your mastery, and where losing sight of the land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push forth the horizons of our hopes and to push us to the future in strength, courage, hope, and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The second thing I want to do is offer thanks. First and foremost, I want to thank all of you for your faithfulness, joy, and hope in these last years. It is a gift to serve as rector here, and I am grateful to God for bringing us together uh, for this period in our life. I also want to thank our wardens, John Vermont and Bonnie Wynn, who are incredible people. They are tireless and faithful, and you are well served and represented and led by them both. They exemplify what is best about this congregation, and I hope that you will thank them both for the long, hard hours they give on behalf of this place and its people. I also want to thank our treasurer, Herb Burton. You'll have heard his report, and his is not an easy job, and it is not one that earns him a lot of love notes either. Each of you should know how sacrificially he has served in this role as parish treasurer through some of our most challenging years. And serving as treasurer in a place this size is difficult in boring years, and these have been anything but boring. And I hope you'll thank him and Sylvia both for being so dedicated to our life together. I'd also like to thank our vestry members who have stepped up in new ways and who come with energy and joy and love to their work. And at the risk of making this seem like a sort of Tony Awards acceptance speech, there are more folks I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank the staff here at St. Philip's. The report I'm about to give represents uh, much of their dedicated work and faithful service, and you are cared for well by them. And few of you will know the hours and sleepless nights and missed time with loved ones that the staff gives. And sure, we pay them, of course, but what you get from them is not just labor, but love. In a parish like this, the rector's report is, at the end of the day, not mine, really. Uh, each of these people and each of the people that make up life here in this congregation all share together what's possible. And if what happened here was only that to which I could pay attention uh, or manage, this would be a small place indeed. So I'm fortunate to have so many capable lay leaders and staff colleagues to encourage and inspire me daily with their faithful dedication. Now this year we have made a shift in our ministry reporting for the annual meeting. The bulk of ministry reporting will come uh, from the annual meeting reports of the commissions that are up and running. You'll see in the annual meeting reports packet that's available online or in person on Sunday morning. Uh, we have reports from the Children, Youth, and Family Commission, the Music Commission, the Creation Care Commission, and the Outreach Commission. In addition to those, you will see a new report which is called a Summary of Financial Practices. That report is designed to provide as much transparency as possible into our financial structures, accounts, and practices. It is designed to reflect any changes to our financial practices and processes so that every parishioner better understands how we arrive at financial decisions and how we manage the generosity that you provide. Now, with those elements covered, uh, it leaves some gaps in our reporting, uh, but today I want to focus uh, on the big picture. That's the real focus of this address. We're going to step back a bit from day-to-day -day questions to look at parish-wide initiatives and where we see the future here. And I want to begin with some very simple table setting, as it were. In 2019, before the pandemic, our sort of average Sunday attendance uh, was just over 500. In uh, 2021, as we emerged from the pandemic, our Sunday attendance was around 270. Uh, in 2022, that number was in the 300s. This past year, it will be in the 400s. Each year has seen a steady recovery. Many parishes around the church are experiencing similar steady recovery, but many more are not. The average Episcopal Church in the United States now has an average Sunday attendance somewhere in the upper 30s. Yes, you heard that right. The average Episcopal Church has an average Sunday attendance of 
of somewhere in the upper 30s, 38, 39. This is really just an acceleration of long-term trends. By the year 2000, it was clear that the Episcopal Church had lost a million members from its peak four decades earlier. And from there, it was sort of a slow and steady erosion. By 2010, our membership was below two million as a church. And every year in the last decade or more of the same, losing a couple hundred thousand members at a time. The church reported 1.68 million in 2021, and then that dropped to 1.58 million in 2022. That loss is devastating when comparing that to the last decade or so of year-over-year -year percentage changes. There were many years where the average dip would be fairly modest, maybe 1 or 1.5 percent, but that trend has accelerated in recent years. In 2020, the church reported a 3.1 percent decline. In 2021, that increased slightly to 3.3 percent. And the drop between 2021 and 2022, even as the recovery was underway, is the largest on record, 5.6 percent in one year. The data is now clear on this point. The losses are piling up and accelerating. 150,000 50, fewer Episcopalians in 2022 compared to 2020, nearly a 10% loss in just 24 months. The membership numbers are bleak, and Sunday attendance numbers don't look much more encouraging. In 2009, the Episcopal Church had 725,000 people in church on an average weekend across the United States. Those held, that had a relatively steady uh, and it went down to about uh, 700,000 in 2011. But from that point forward, weekly attendance began dropping at a faster rate, typically a decline of about 3% per year. And then COVID happened, and it is clear as day in the data that it has had a deleterious effect on the weekly attendance patterns of Episcopalians, indeed on the weekly attendance patterns of many Christians. Attendance dropped 11% from 2019 to 2020, then in 2021, of course, weekly attendance was down 40%. Of course, we can uh, guess that that's because many churches chose not to meet in person during much of the pandemic. But the number has recovered somewhat in 2022. Uh, but the church now reports a weekly attendance figure of about 373,000, an increase of 27% from the prior low in 2021. But that 373,000 is down from 547,000 in 2019. That represents a decrease of 32% in just three years. The largest and fastest, or the fastest growing religious group in the United States is now no religion, none. Our own decrease from 2019 is significant, 18%, but our opportunities are even more significant. The question is not just how many people are coming, but who is coming. What we see every Sunday is more families coming to the church where other churches are recovering bits of their past, we are seeing our future gather. Few churches in the Episcopal Church have so many children running around. We now have 16 nursery volunteers to help make that ministry happen. We are nearing 120 children registered in our children's program. That's up from 85 in 2019, representing a 41% increase. Our six-year-old children's pageant on Christmas Eve is now our largest Christmas Eve service. In its first year, we had 16 kids involved, and this year we had 52. Our parish is younger and more financially stable than we were in 2019. Growth has come not only in terms of numbers in our CYFM program, but you look at some of the other metrics. Our average pledge in 2016 was just over $1,800. Our average pledge now is just over $3,800. These two factors, an influx of young families and increasing financial stability, represent our future together. They are the product of almost eight years of work and planning. We had our largest confirmation class in more than 20 years this past year. We've seen growth in programming. Our parents group is large and vibrant. New outreach efforts, our creation care, commissions, small groups, and Bible studies have all started. A new strategic plan is underway, approved last spring. And that plan focuses on outreach, formation, and continued growth. Of course, we've equipped for live streaming, upgraded our kitchen, begun to improve our security systems, launched new concert series and new mission and outreach partnerships. During the pandemic, we raised enough money to buy and forgive over $4 million in medical debt for more than 1,700 households in Southern Arizona. 
And I'm pleased to say that we have raised enough to buy and forgive an additional $1.5 million this year. The breadth of our membership across ages is unique among Episcopal churches. The current projections have 25% or more of Episcopal churches closing in the coming decade. We are defying those trends. Unlike so many churches whose average age gets older each year, our average age here is getting younger each year. I often liken Paris transitions uh, to turning a plane. The faster you make change, the faster you turn, the more turbulence there is. But the faster you're flying out of the turn once you've made it. In 2016, when I arrived, I wrote up a five-year plan that uh, we had crammed into seven and a half years thanks to COVID. That plan accounted for steady growth and a steady financial recovery. COVID made nothing steady, but it accelerated trends already underway. The marginally churched, irregular attendees for whom church was something more of a hobby have left during COVID. They have not returned, here or anywhere. In this church, a steady growth in children and families has accelerated since COVID. Our finances, significantly impacted by inflation, nonetheless proved resilient, uh, thanks to the creativity and generosity on the part of so many here. And we've had to take all of this into account as we plan for the future. With that in mind, we needed to draw up a revised strategic plan, and John Wozak helped guide that work and continues to help monitor its implementation. A first key component of that plan is participating in the Renewal Works Spiritual Vitality Survey. Through a guided methodology of self-reflection, sharing, and workshop discussion, Renewal Works challenges parishes to refocus on spiritual growth and to identify ways that God is calling them to grow. Renewal Works is a catalyst for refocusing parishes and the individuals in them on spiritual vitality. It has been tailored to the Episcopal tradition, adapting 10 years of research that has uncovered key characteristics of flourishing congregations. The Spiritual Life Inventory includes a personalized report based on our congregation's data and benchmarked against more than 1,800 churches from many denominations that have also taken the survey over the past decade. The Renewal Works process begins with an anonymous, confidential online survey that's called the Episcopal Spiritual Life Inventory that's taken by congregants and explores that individual's spiritual life. Individual responses are then combined and viewed as in aggregate as a group, providing a snapshot of the spiritual vitality of the whole congregation based on research from those 1,800 congregations of all denominations and almost half a million congregants who have participated in the survey. Next, along with staff from Renewal Works, our parish team has gathered to delve into the specifics of the data over four guided workshops. This group contemplates the following questions, one at each workshop. Where have we been? Where are we now? Where do we feel called to go? And how will we get there? Specific outcomes of the Renewal Works process are unique to each parish, reflecting that community's specific challenges and opportunities. They lead to the creation of specific congregation-wide growth initiatives, which clarify and elevate expectations for clergy, lay leaders, and individuals. So why does this matter for us? You can think of the story of the lawyer approaching Jesus, putting him to the test with the question, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus' response was simple. It, it's not easy. He said it was about love of God with all your heart and soul and mind and love of neighbor as ourselves. That singular emphasis on love of God and neighbor provides the foundation for Renewal Works, a ministry focusing on spiritual growth by deepening love of God and neighbor in the lives of congregations in the lives of ministries that animate those congregations, and in the lives of the individuals who bring to life those ministries. When the details of life press in, parishes like individuals can inadvertently move away from that kind of singular, simple focus on discipleship to the more mundane but necessary actions of running a church. Renewal Works brings their focus back to Jesus' response to the lawyer. It helps us chart the spiritual and programmatic life of the parish in the years ahead so that we can refocus on the love of God and love of our neighbor. It helps us figure out what will happen in the buildings all around us. But I guess then there is the question of the buildings themselves. I'm deeply grateful to a team of folks from preservation and endowment, buildings and grounds, the staff, and more, who have worked to complete a new reserve study to look at the long-term needs of our campus 
and chart out a plan for what needs to be done and how we look at funding that work. Every air conditioner, roof, and more are all accounted for in this plan. Their estimated useful life is estimated so that we can begin to project with the help of a firm that has done uh, this for a huge number of uh, properties. We can begin to estimate what our costs will be and how we can most efficiently and responsibly plan for maintaining the campus. And of course, that work always begs the question, what will we do with these buildings? And that is where a campus master plan is going to be helpful. As many know, we began developing a campus master plan with an eye toward both preserving what we have inherited and adapting it to make it more accessible, sustainable, and visible in the years ahead. For many, this campus is our first evangelist. And the master plan will be laid alongside that reserve study I talked about to assess where projects that are not emergency needs can be timed in such a way that work we might do to develop or improve one part of the campus does not result in duplicating work or resources used. One of the goals of the master plan is to shape spaces based on who we are and where we hope to go. A simple example is the columbarium. We have known that we are running out of niches there. We also know that we'd like some sort of dedicated worship space out there. We know it's difficult, it's a difficult space to access, especially for those with mobility issues. And so a master plan will take all of those things into account and ensure that we did not spend money on a wall section or a bench or a planter that would just need to be removed later to make improvements possible. It also ensures that we don't do something like a big expansion of irrigation when the master plan calls for a reduction in water use over time. These examples give a sense of the practical benefits, and there are others too. For example, if we lay the master plan next to our strategic plan, it begins to help guide all of our work. For example, if we see in our master plan a call for new ways to serve the homeless, and Renewal Works demonstrates a desire for that kind of ministry and outreach, we can begin to look at various spaces and imagine how they might be changed or adapted to make such a ministry possible. For example, if we build shower facilities on campus, making it possible for us to be an effective overnight shelter when temperatures fluctuate in dangerous ways. That's one example of the many, many kinds of questions ahead of us. As we look at each of the plans being laid out, Renewal Works, the Strategic Plan, the Campus Master Plan, and one piece I would like to talk about briefly is a potential project that could both be part of helping secure our finances in the future and helping us meet a real and immediate need in our community's life. The north end of our property has been looked at for various possibilities in the past, and we have recently begun conversations with La Frontera, which specializes in developing affordable housing communities. As you know, housing prices have soared and pushed many to the brink of homelessness. We are looking at the possibility of building something like a small village of units specifically tailored to meet the needs of older folks living with adult children with disabilities and veterans as well. These would be units with rents capped at a certain rate to assure their affordability. This is affordable senior housing. It's not a halfway house or transitional housing. It is designed to catch those people being pushed to the brink by housing costs and help them avoid the real possibility of homelessness. Jesus tells his disciples that if they clothed, fed, and cared for those in need, they were caring for him. In this way, we might imagine ourselves housing a homeless Lord and making room for him not only in our property, but in our hearts as well. Such a project would involve little in the way of financial outlay from the parish beyond the cost of the land, and would offer a regular residual income over time annually to the parish, with the whole project, all of its buildings, reverting to full parish ownership after a set period of time. Our Outreach Commission is using this year as a discernment year about how such a community here on campus could impact and drive outreach efforts and help us focus our energy on the questions around homelessness and housing and security. This is an example of where our property, our mission, our sustainability, and our future all come into alignment. Such efforts take creativity and energy and planning and execution. But those are things we have in abundance here, thanks to the gifts of so many lay leaders. There is much more I could say, more thanks I could offer, more plans I could share, more details about a myriad number of things I could lay out. And I hope that if you have questions, you will uh, ask them on Sunday morning at our Q&A time. But I want to close where I began, with prayer and with thanks. Thank you to each and every one of you who is part of life here at St. Phillips in the Hills. 
Any success, growth, possibility, and change we see here is made possible because of you and your commitment to Christ in this place. I remain convinced that the Episcopal Church is the best secret in Christianity in this country. We are a church that seeks to love when the world pushes us to hate. We are a source of tradition and stability when so much seems like it's being pulled up and tossed aside. We are a place of beauty, care for our neighbor, and welcome to all. We are not perfect, and no church is. If we spend all of our time looking for the perfect church, we spend all of our time looking. But we are striving, we are reaching, we are changing, and we are growing. And thank you for making it happen. And thanks be to God for the gift of being part of it together, gathered in love and transformed by grace and sent to serve. Let us pray. O oh God, give us strength to live another day. Let us not turn coward before its challenges or lazy to its duties. Let us not lose faith in other people. Keep us loving and sound of heart in spite of ingratitude or meanness. Preserve us from minding little stings or giving them. Help us to keep our hearts open and to live so honestly and fearlessly that no outward failure can dishearten us or take away the joy of love for you. Open wide the eyes of our souls that we may see good in all things and all people. Grant us this day some new vision of thy truth. Inspire us with the spirit of joy and gladness, and make us a source of strength to suffering souls. In the name of our Deliverer, our only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.